distinction now is uh, that home rule allows cities in Colorado to specify um, certain details with respect to oil and gas, fracking, um, setbacks, how far from um, whatever they have to be. But it does not allow them to ban the activity entirely within their municipal borders because there is a state law and a state Supreme Court decision that says oil and gas exploration is a priority, is an interest of the state of Colorado. So my question to you is, do you think that's an appropriate distinction or should a home rule city like Longmont or Lafayette or Boulder or Fort Collins be able to say, no, we don't want drilling within our borders, and that is a province of home rule as well? Well, I, I am, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on constitutional law as, a, as, a, as it comes to home rule cities. I knew what the, the prerogatives were of, of Denver, mm -hmm. except when the Pouncell Amendment came along and, and basically <laughs> said, <laughs> except for this one home rule, you can't annex land like right. any other place can. But again, I think the, I, I'm hopeful this governor's commission will come up with the right kind of balance, which protects not just home rule cities, but any city, any municipality that may not have home rule status, like Denver and Colorado Springs, and I guess Boulder, Boulder does, does too. Boulder County does not. Boulder, right. And I think city. Is Broomfield now? Broomfield sure. does, I believe. Yeah, the city is it home rule? Yes. So, uh, but again, I think there's some balance that can be um, struck there. Um, but there are also some other factors at work here, and that is that the companies that are doing the drilling, um, sometimes people may perceive them as being these innocuous, mechanistic, android entities that don't care about what they're doing. There's something called reputational risk that most American companies worry a lot about because they know that reputational risk can damage your, if you're a publicly traded company, your your stock price. And frankly, things happen to companies who don't care about their reputation. So I think that if you come up with some reasonable rules and a reasonable balance, I think most of the parties will find a way to, to reach a consensus where most people will be satisfied. Um, will everybody be satisfied? No. There are some people who will never want another oil and gas rig drill anywhere in America. You could put it in the middle of the desert and they are simply opposed to that mm -hmm. for very strict environmental reasons. There are other people who are on the other side who will say, we, if Exxon Mobil wants to drill in downtown Denver, they should be able to do it. Those aren't what I consider to be the, the reasonable majority of people in, in the middle. And I think the majority of people in the middle are, are, are going to find that there's a way to reach a compromise here. Some mistakes have been made along the way. I think one of the mistakes made by some members of the oil and gas industry was a reluctance to share the ingredients and the materials they were injecting into the ground on the, on the basis that somehow that was a trade secret. That was a mistake. There are a lot of corporations that share very important financial information and other information with the federal government, with state governments, on, in many other sectors. And um, had, I think, the industry a long time ago said, State Department of Natural Resources or whatever agency is going to look at this, if we share with you how much sand and chemicals and what we're putting into the land, you've got to guarantee that you won't share that with our competitors. And by the way, if you do, there's a $5 billion penalty you've got to pay me. Then that could have been done. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning, when a number of companies were reluctant to even do that, I think that cast a cloud of suspicion on them, and they could have avoided that. Last question on this topic. Boulder, as you know, is pretty far down the road now in pursuing municipalization of its electric utility, or basically condemning Excel's assets within the city limits mm -hmm. and, and taking them over. Um, you've been a mayor, and you've been a secretary of energy. Give me, if you would, sort of the pros and the cons of that. Is that uh, you know, it's, it's been argued that that will increase the speed with which they move to renewables. Is that really true? What do you think? Well, I, I followed it from a distance, so I, I can't say I've followed all the intricacies of, of what Boulder has done. I would simply say this. Any community that wants to move in that direction first ask, has to ask itself, what is its goal? What are you trying to accomplish? In most cases, when municipal do this. The concern is that 
the price of electricity is too high, and that their customers and their uh, constituents are being taken advantage of. And so let's find, and, and also um, for companies that are in that city, they're at an uncompetitive uh, position compared to a competitor who is in a surrounding county that has lower electricity prices. So if the purpose is to rein in prices, because prices are escalating too quickly, that's a very legitimate reason to do something. Um, generally speaking, the fact is that Colorado electricity rates are not out of line with the nation as a whole. Um, some people don't like a penny increase, but we're not out of line. If the reason is to have more, as a matter of public policy of the people of Boulder or any community, that it wants to move more quickly towards renewables, and that's a different kind of reason, but it's also a legitimate reason. So I think uh, if it is to have more, quote, control over its destiny and not be exposed to the, the forces of a multi-state corporation, that might be another reason. So different communities might have different reasons. Um, but I think the community first has to agree on what its, pri what its priority is. What problem is it trying to fix? Is there a problem? And if there is, then you set about trying to figure out how to do it. Now the second, once you've, once you've decided that you have a legitimate, well understood and universally accepted purpose for doing this. The next question is, can you do it in a way that is financially responsible? The last thing you want to do if you take over a system is to end up with rates that are higher for your constituents than they were under the base case scenario. You will, be, you will have some very unhappy voters. And secondly, you'll have companies who will start leaving and they'll start moving elsewhere where they can get ch cheaper electricity prices. That's what's happening today in the United States. Companies are leaving, particularly large manufacturing plants that use a lot of leading states where they're playing exorbitant electricity rates. They're moving elsewhere where they get cheaper rates. So if you're going to go down that path, the people who are planning this have to have fairly a high degree of fairly high, fairly high degree of confidence that they're going to end up with competitive rates or maybe even lower rates. Um, and then thirdly, if the goal is to have more renewable alternative energy, then there's a way to do that. But again, you've got to assure yourself that you can do it in a way that doesn't cause rates to go up for the taxpayer. Because unless you can answer all those questions with some reasonable assurance, and you can never have absolute certainty, then I think there are risks to doing it. On the other hand, if you can answer those questions with reasonable certainty, then I think it's a very plausible and reasonable thing for a community to do. I think the first and main point that the opponents make is the question of competence. Is the city government going to run an electric utility with the same competence as a company that is devoted entirely to that purpose and has decades and decades of experience? It, it is a legitimate question. Now, there are examples of cities that have been running their power companies for years right. very competent. Um, it's a unique skill set. Uh, you've got to have people who are very knowledgeable about a lot of very complicated issues. Are you going to build your own power plants? Uh, are you going to build your own solar and wind? Or are you going to buy power from other places? And if so, how are you going to buy it? Are you, are you going to invest in a uh, renewable energy plant in the middle of Mojave Desert and then have that electricity imported into the city. These are all highly, highly technical questions that are not for novices. So that's point number one. Point number two is the financial side of this. Uh, running this kind of a, of a utility is very complicated from a capital investment perspective, from a maintenance perspective, and then from perspective of setting reasonable rates so you can bring in enough revenue to make sure your operations run profitably. Now, the good news is you don't need a margin of return that a utility needs, but you still need a profit because you're going to have to have reserves to maintain the, the infrastructure that, that, that you are now owning. So a lot of very complicated issues, but a lot of cities have done this and they've done it very well. 
The last thing you want to do, however, is end up in a situation where any community that does this all of a sudden ends up with higher rates compared to neighbors. And then people are going to start leaving the city. We're starting to complain. The other point I want to make is that if you look at other areas like water, the Denver Water Department is a highly sophisticated enterprise. Uh, probably one of the best water systems in America. I would say run far better than a lot of other private water companies that I'm aware of. So it is not necessarily true that a governmental entity cannot run a utility of some kind. And we've seen examples both of water and electricity where municipalities have done it and done a very good job and have served their customers quite well. I have a, a little anecdote here to tell you. My father was appointed to the first public utility commission in Brownsville, Texas, when the city of Brownsville decided to own its own uh, electricity. Water or electricity? Electricity. And I remember he used to stay up late at night reading about turbines and all this kind of stuff. He was a lay person. Somehow Brownsville managed to do it. Mm. it. Took a long time, and they didn't do it overnight. Um, and maybe it was a different set of circumstances in how they started that. But again, there are communities who own their own electricity um, systems and, and do it very well. So those are the issues that I think the people of Boulder have to have to review and, and study very carefully. But you, you get very smart people who are working on this. And they know all these issues, and we've simply got to, at the end of the day, conclude. Do we have a reasonable amount of certainty that we can do this profitably to the extent that you need surpluses? You can do it in a way that doesn't make us uncompetitive with surrounding areas, that doesn't increase rates, because that's basically a tax on people, and can achieve these other goals that we want to achieve in terms of using renewable power and cleaner energy. Those are all things that are doable if the plan works.